The idea of the innovation campus in Soldana Bay has been brewing in our minds for years and our passion to bring it to life remains unwavering. Our dream is that the Soldana Bay Innovation Campus is a meeting of hearts and of minds and collectively creating a better future for the local energy and maritime sectors. Our hope is that it evokes a fresh sense of possibility and inspires us to push beyond our perceived boundaries into the art of the impossible. Hello and welcome to this edition of Innovate the Blue. I'm Davis Cook, your host for today. I'm the Chief Executive for Rees, a boutique strategy consulting firm, but more importantly for this podcast, I'm also Director at ZA Space, the private sector industry body for the South African space sector. And to you, our listeners, thanks for tuning in, and please remember to like, follow, and engage with us through your favorite social media channel. Today, I have the privilege of chatting with Francois Fisser, Chief Engineer at CPUT's Africa Space Innovation Center. Francois, if you could say a few words about yourself, Hello, Davis. Uh, thank you, firstly, for having me. I'm the Chief Engineer of the Africa Space Innovation Center, or ASIC, as we call it, at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. I'm a radio frequency microwave engineer by training, and I started my career in satellite systems engineering in 1995 on the Sunset Microsatellite Project at Stellenbosch University. I've been fortunate enough to be involved in the South African space industry for more than 20 years. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm sure that you have all sorts of fascinating stories and hopefully we'll be able to to dig into a few of those over the course of of today. So one of the things that we've been wanting to do on the Innovate the Blue podcast is talk to a diverse range of people about the technologies and the innovations that they are bringing into the local energy and maritime sectors. Now, I'm really trying to sort of create an awareness of the opportunities that exist within these sectors and just more generally in, in the Western Cape. Now, we know that South Africa and the Western Cape have a significant wealth of knowledge. You know, the Western Cape itself is known for having a very dynamic and robust innovation ecosystem that really drives a lot of creative and innovative solutions across all sorts of exciting different sectors, whether it's fintech or wine, agriculture, and now hopefully also maritime and energy through the work that the Innovation Campus is doing. And to paraphrase one of our previous guests, part of the thinking here is around developing African solutions for African problems. And I think it's very important for us that we ground and locate some of the really exciting work that is being done as being of a locally developed origin. But I think one of the challenges we've we've faced is that many of these technologies, these solutions, remain pretty unknown to the broader industry. And so they don't always reach their full potential within the South African market, uh, you know, or elsewhere in Africa or the rest of the world. And so this innovation showcase series is a mechanism for the innovation campus to raise awareness of the research, development and innovation that's occurring locally, and highlight its possible applications and functions, and really just create a little bit more excitement about all the, the really cool stuff that we are doing um, here in South Africa. And so, you know, we'll be chatting a little bit today about, you know, how, how ASIC views the idea of innovation getting a little bit more insight into what this technology looks like and the implications that it might have for the maritime industry. And then maybe try and get into a little bit more about some of the history, um, about how this came about and, you know, what are the potential opportunities in in future? If I could maybe sort of start, Francois, just from your perspective, how do you define innovation in the work that you do? Are there differences between innovation, research and development? You know, how do you guys think about that? Davis, I would define innovation from my perspective as an engineer, and engineering is all about solving problems. I would say innovation is the act of harnessing your knowledge and experience, and typically also that of a team of people to ultimately devise a number of different solutions for a problem, and then pick the the best one to develop. So in that sense, it is uh, different from research and development in the sense that I believe this process comes before R&D and uh, R&D results from innovation. Thanks. And I think there's something that you mentioned, which for me certainly is really important, which is the idea of teamwork. 
um, which is around, it's not just one person who's you know, coming up with some brilliant idea and changing the world, but that it's very much a, a team effort. And so, you know, within that, that context, you know, we'd mentioned that you, you're doing some really interesting work around satellites. Um, so take us through some of, of what you've done and, and why it's important. In a nutshell, my team and I developed these nanosatellites as well as a set of radio products that we sell on the interna international market and that other CubeSat users can use for their own satellites. And our team at ASIC is currently developing two CubeSat satellite missions. We're aiming for a total of five satellites to be completed in the next year. These satellites are very small nanosatellites. They're typically up to 30 centimeters in length. So compared to the conventional satellites that you may think of, these are quite small. They're launched into orbit around the Earth, and each satellite carries a payload of some sort. The payloads in our satellite have been designed to communicate with AIS and VDES radios aboard ocean vessels. And these payloads have been developed in collaboration with uh, partners of ours, a company called Stone 3 Communications in Somerset West. Uh, they are specialists in software-defined radio, and they have developed terrestrial AIS and VDES products and solutions that are currently used all over the world. AIS is the automatic identification system that was regionally developed for collision avoidance among ships. And it allows a radio on a ship to broadcast its location to other ships and coastal base stations. VDES is a VHF data exchange system. It is hailed as the next generation of AIS. It is a new standard that provides much larger bandwidth than AIS, and it also supports two-way communications. These nanosatellites, which I guess 30 centimeters is about the size of a loaf of bread, so really, really quite small. We've obviously had other satellites that are working in this AIS um, and VDES system. I hope I, I got those acronyms right. You know, how do these nanosatellites that CPUT has developed through ASIC, how do they change the status quo? Why are they cool? Usually ships would communicate via terrestrial coastal base stations, and therefore the communications range would be limited to the horizon, which is typically 40 or 50 kilometers away. But in recent years, it has become evident that satellites in space can also receive messages from ships in this AIS band and relay them to an operations room. With the addition of links via satellites, ships can now use VDES to transmit and receive messages from anywhere on the planet. The orbit of the satellite brings it over South Africa between four and six times a day. So with enough satellites, one can provide continuous coverage over a target area. And satellite AIS allows the continuous tracking of ocean traffic, not only when a ship is near the coast. This uh, has allowed much more efficient management of the ocean and its resources. So regulators can use this data in conjunction with synthetic aperture radar imagery to identify cases like illegal bulge dumping uh, done by ships and uh, also illegal fishing in restricted zones. In the longer term, VDES has the potential to greatly enhance maritime communication, especially where sat phone and VSAT is not an option. The satellite component of VDES provides the ability to cover large areas cost effectively. In, in areas where there is poor, poor communications infrastructure, a single satellite providing the VDES service can provide automatic stored and forward messaging up to six times a day. So there is a lot of value in this sort of technology especially adding the satellite component to the existing terrestrial component. Thanks. And, and you know, I think this, this question of illegal fishing has definitely come up a lot more uh, in, re in recent times. But also, you know, I'd imagine that elements such as what happened with uh, the Wakashio, North Mauritius, these kinds of, of elements is also kind of is critical. And so, you know, you mentioned something like synthetic ap aperture radar. Can you just sort of take us through a little bit about what SAR is and, and how, it, uh, how it can be used? Like, how is it different from, from what you've been putting up there so far? For synthetic aperture radar, you require quite a large satellite. The synthetic aperture radar uses an antenna that typically falls out from the satellite, so it can be many meters long. So unfortunately, that is a technology that's not feasible for the nano satellites that we're working on. So our Technology is largely complementary to the synthetic aperture radar. 
what SAR does is beam down a signal to the ground and it measures the reflection. And through some wonderful physics, uh, one can build up a highly um, detailed, uh, high resolution image of the ground. And you can gain benefits that you can't gain with optical imaging. So you, you can typically see through clouds. You can uh, measure very, very fine detail on the ground that you might not be able to measure with optical systems. It's very effective at imaging things like uh, oil on the water and uh, sense different dielectric properties of uh, what it is looking at. So uh, these things stand out much more than they do with uh, optical imagery. And maybe speaking about different complementary technologies also, I, I guess, require complementary skill sets. And you mentioned earlier that it's yourself and this team that have been doing this work. So can you tell me a little bit more about ASIC itself? You know, a little bit of the background, you know, how many people are there? What are the kind of skills that you guys are developing? The satellite is quite a diverse system. Many subsystems in, in there that require a wide range of uh, disciplines, engineering disciplines. So as part of the team, we have a wide variety of skills Typical satellite consists of a computer, some radios for remote control, maybe a separate radio to get high volumes of data down to the ground. It might be a control system to allow you to point the satellite in a certain direction. There will be solar panels and a battery and a power supply to make sure that everything receives energy. And then there's a structure that keeps everything together. So all these disciplines have to be covered and for each of those disciplines, we have an engineer looking after that. So we've got a number of mechanical engineers. We have two mechanical engineers at the moment, and uh, the rest of the team are um, electrical, electronic engineers. Obviously, there's a lot of software, so uh, some of the guys write software as well. Um, that is, in fact, the last component on the satellite that's created before it goes on to the launch vehicle. We might finish building the satellite months before the launch, but we can literally write software until a few weeks before launch. It's a very diverse team indeed. Oh, that's, that's fascinating. And is ASIC um, the only such organization or, or kind of department um, at a university level within South Africa? Um, are there other groups around the country that you, you work with? There are definitely other groups in the past the small sat space industry in South Africa started with Sunset at the University of Stellenbosch in, um, in the 90s. And that was really the project that uh, was the catalyst for uh, a number of companies to pop up all over the place. So at CPUT, our focus started on radio systems for satellites. And then we've progressed to building complete missions. We've worked together with the original lab where Sunset was built, the electronic systems lab at Stellenbosch. Uh, they are still active. Over the last decade or so, they developed cutting edge control systems for satellites. So that is their niche area. And we, in fact, use their subsystems on our satellites. So there's, there's some collaboration within the country between uh, these groups. I'm not aware of other groups in the country that holds satellites, but there are many companies that have spawned from this activity. And there is a, a healthy hub of satellite engineering companies in the Western Cape. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the whole, the whole upstream cluster is, is really well concentrated in and around the Western Cape area. I guess I'm sure that, that you'll, you'll be aware of, um, and maybe just for our listeners as well, there is a, a very large space infrastructure hub that is being planned as part of the presidential infrastructure program um, being supported by, by SANSA, which is around four and a half billion rand worth of investment to take place over the next several years. You know, so there's, there's a, a really important drive, I guess, to support the space technology sector. So how, how do you think the future of uh, the South African-based technology sector can progress, you know, particularly on the upstream side when we're talking about satellites? You know, what do you think is, is possible for us in, in the future? There are a number of companies in the Western Cape that are currently operating independently of government funding. And the other companies mostly get interna international funding or have international clients to build satellites or to build, build subsystems for satellites. What I would like to see is that there is a there's healthy support from government for the, the local space industry and to put more money into um, supporting 
the already established industry uh, in uh, developing technologies and complete satellites for the international market. Is this technology only applicable within the South African environment, or could these kinds of technologies equally be used by some of our other neighboring countries? You know, would a similar opportunity exist in Namibia, with whom we share adjacent coastal fishing waters? So is this something exclusively for South Africa, or can it potentially service markets outside of South Africa? I can perhaps answer that question in two uh, steps. The first is that the CubeSat standard that we follow for our satellites uses a a standardized uh, form factor and standardized, to some extent, standardized subsystems, which allows developers to create subsystems that are compatible with other CubeSats and can therefore be swapped with or made available for other projects worldwide. I think that's the, that's the first thing that's that's important to note about CubeSat technology, and um, we, we can see as a result of CubeSats, they've been around for about 20 years now, and there's a large number of companies worldwide that have started manufacturing CubeSat subsystems or whole CubeSats, and um, there's a booming industry out there. That is definitely not only just a South African On the other hand, the technology that we're currently implementing in MDA SAT the current mission that we're working on, and uh, the next one, M2M SAT, is meant to be applicable to other use cases uh, other than just maritime domain awareness. Our progression in the development of our missions is to improve the payload every time, and there's been a revision from our previous satellite to MDA SAT to add uh, additional capabilities over and above AIS. We can also now receive the channels for uh, application-specific messages, and um, there's some other capabilities in the payload as well. The M2M sat satellite will again use an upgraded payload that supports VDES, so we improve the payload incrementally. VDES is only the beginning of a bi-directional data sharing network, and it can be upscaled to different frequency bands, different bandwidths, different uh, communication rates and applications for all sorts of machine-to-machine communication and uh, Internet of Things. So uh, this is basically just the beginning of uh, something much larger and um, can be applied to, to missions worldwide. That's really, really interesting stuff. How does this get applied to other industries or sectors. So you're saying this is just the beginning of something much larger. Are these kinds of technologies, uh, you know, I, I know that the, the, the recent satellites put up by CPUT um, was around marine domainers, or marine, marine domain awareness. Are we able to use the same technologies in other sectors beyond just marine? The machine-to-machine communications technology that we are currently developing for our next mission, M2MSAT, will provide a generic data communications platform that can be used in many, many different industries. VDS can be seen as a subset of uh, more generalized machine-to-machine communication. If you expand the concept of machine-to-machine communication, it really means that you can have a device somewhere that's not close to an existing network uh, and that can get its data communicated out via a satellite network to a hub or a base station somewhere. So that can be applied to uh, almost any industry. Some examples that I can think of at the moment is where ESCOM wants to remotely monitor their network. So they have sensors connected to their network in remote locations that are far away from cell phone towers. And that data is collected on a by minute basis or hourly, and that can be beamed across a satellite link uh, using our technology to a base station and collected at a, at a central hub. Another interesting application is of course, vehicle tracking. And uh, there is already an industry out there to do uh, vehicle tracking via satellite. But you can have small sensors using um, Internet of Things chipsets that use very, very little power. It transmits very little data, but all you need is a location beacon to be sent across the satellite link. And it's been proven that the uh, LoRa chipsets that are ubiquitous in the IoT world can actually be picked up by a satellite which is great for IoT networks uh, everywhere. You you can have a a sensor in the middle of a desert consuming very little power, measuring measuring temperature or uh, 
a sensor somewhere out in a, in a field on a farm measuring soil characteristics. And um, that information can be um, gathered by the farmer every time a satellite comes over. Okay, yeah, and I can absolutely see that by being able to create this widespread communication network um, that really opens up a lot of new opportunities around, you know, the use of IoT and, and so on. Something I want to kind of just get a little bit more understanding about, but you mentioned that there was a device to device communication that I understand correctly. Yes, machine to machine, uh, machine to machine communication is defined as electronic communications between two devices uh, without human intervention. So it is largely automated. So it can be a device that has been set up by humans somewhere in a remote location and programmed to do a specific job. And then from then on until uh, power runs out, it can uh, be emit a little signal periodically and auto autonomously communicate with the satellite to get its data out from its remote location. Okay, so, so basically the satellites would communicate with, I guess, the AIS transceivers on the ships and, you know, we as humans don't have to, you know, interact with that at all, right? BDES, which can be considered as a subset of machine-to-machine -machine communication, will allow machine-to-machine -machine communication. Um, perhaps it can be used on ocean buoys or sensors in the water or autonomous underwater vehicles, or what have you, but uh, it will also provide functionality for, for human communication. So it's it's not only just for machine to machine communication. Uh, and I think it, it, you know, it leads to one of the things that I've been following a little bit, but maybe you have some visibility on this as well. So I guess two questions. One is at what height do these satellites operate? Um, are they in very low orbit or where are they sitting? The second question that sits around that in terms of what is their, their specific orbit is there's recently been quite a lot of debate about, for example, the new Starlink project that SpaceX is putting up from a communications point of view. Uh, and they're launching something like 120 of these Starlink satellites on a, on a monthly basis. And I, I, you know, I recently saw a, a court case happening in the US between, I think it's the Amazon crowd and you know Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and all these other billionaires who are you know, trying to launch lots of satellites into space. But there's this real concern about just putting more and more satellites into space, issues around them colliding with each other. There was a, an article a couple of days ago about how Starlink very narrowly missed another satellite. But first of all, is there any risk that the, the satellites that we're putting up there at the moment are in the pathway of some of these? And I mean, just more generally, like how do we how do we deal with that? Is, is that a real concern that we as people on the ground have to have to care about? Starlink for me is an example of, of progress, necessary progress that is at loggerheads with re regulatory issues. We quite often see this where someone comes up with a great idea and wants to put thousands of satellites into space because you know the, the resources are available and it will be uh, fantastic for mankind. But then you have this other issue of um, space debris. Space debris is definitely a huge issue that mankind should look at as a, as a very high priority. So to manage the space debris problem, it's just another engineering problem. And I believe that it can be solved if it, if it is approached properly and if everybody just applies the due diligence to actually solve it. Just from an engineering perspective, the ways that you can mitigate the problem is to launch low enough so that uh, space objects and parts of space objects like rocket bodies don't stay up there for hundreds of years. Currently, uh, worldwide leg legislation suggests that satellites and space, other space objects must deorbit within 25 years. And that if everybody sticks to that, then everything should be fine and we'll keep the numbers of the objects low enough. So our approach at ASIC is to choose our launches so that we are below about 550 kilometers. We've done a lot of analyses on orbit degradation and the orbit at the decay of the orbit is very much influenced by space weather and solar, solar activity and so forth. So you have to revisit these calculations from time to time because there's no one generic rule that uh, applies forever. At the moment, our satellites are launched to a height of 550 kilometers, which will allow them to deorbit within 25 kilometers. 
other solutions to this problem would include building the orbit devices into your satellite so that once its useful life, life is over, that you can remove it from orbit. I guess what SpaceX tries to do is they have propulsion on these satellites, so they are able to autonomously maneuver these satellites out of the way of other objects. I guess uh, it, whether that's an effective enough measure, uh, time will only tell. No, no. So, so it sounds like it, it's not a problem that we have to worry about, you know, satellites falling on our heads. No, but the, the problem is that if there are any more collisions up there that create uh, hundreds of parts of debris, the chances that there will be more collisions just exponentially increases. And if it comes to that point where there's just too much debris up there that you can't safely la launch a satellite, then low Earth orbit becomes useless to mankind. And you can just imagine the all the technology that currently depends on low Earth orbit will no longer be usable for us, or we might have to go and launch to different orbits, which might not be economically feasible. So this is a huge resource to mankind that must be managed as well as we manage anything else. Because if, if we lose it, it will have a, a dire impact on, on all of humankind. And I'm trying to say that without sounding too, too, too dramatic, but uh, that isn't the case. No, I, I think I think drama is is important in some um, some circumstances, and I think that as you say, this is such a an amazing asset that we have access to. That you know, cutting off our ability to access low Earth orbit in the future is something that will you know absolutely uh, harm future generations if they don't have the ability to access space and and the value that space technologies can can bring to us. So Rosa, I wanted to to maybe find out like what is next for for ASIC. So you've got these these MGA satellites that has gone up. Where to next for for you guys as an organisation, and, and what do you think can can we expect to hear from you in the future? Our roadmap for ASIC is to continue building satellites and to augment our current fleet of satellites up there. In the ASAT will be three satellites that will be launched simultaneously. Uh, we've just integrated the flight models of those satellites. They were undergoing environmental testing. The launch is scheduled for the end of the year. In parallel, we're building the two M2M sat satellites. As I said, those have improved payloads on board. So our plan is to continue improving the technology and to serve more and more use cases. But it must be noted that we can't implement a useful system with only two or three or five satellites. If you want to build a network that has 100% coverage all of the time on the ground, you need uh, several tens of satellites in space uh, doing the same thing and uh, talking with each other. So that is huge capital investment. And until such, such investment becomes available, um, all that we can do is continue improving the technology and testing the technology in space on uh, basically demonst dem demonstration missions as M2MSAT will be. At the moment, we're in the initial stages of the M2MSAT mission. We're uh, compiling user requirements, so soon we will have a session with potential stakeholders to discuss user requirements for this mission. I think it's important that we get buy-in from the industry, from the maritime industry and potential users. I think the, the support that we will need to roll out a real-world solution to support a real-world use case will require collaboration and support from industry, from those users. Because there will be some development that we can do on the satellite, but there will be development that a user will have to do on, on his end of the link to make the technology work with his application. So there, there will be industry support and industry collaboration necessary for a full end-to-end -end solution. Well, Francois, thanks so much for, for sharing all of this kind of really exciting, these really exciting insights for us around not just the, the MBA program, but also what you guys are doing at, at ASIC. I think for me, some of the, the lessons or the things that I've learned through this, firstly, is around there really are some amazing capabilities and skills and technologies that we are developing and building here in South Africa. Um, I think, you know, the idea that we are building bread loaf sized satellites put into space to help analyze a lot of kind of really critical problems for the country, I think is, is an amazing insight to have. And I think it's something that we should celebrate and kind of do more of. 
I think that the second thing that I, I've I've learned out of today's session is around the the different ways that these satellites can help solve problems, whether it's in you know illegal fishing. You know, you mentioned identification of oil spills, for example, with SAR. So there's a whole lot of technologies that we have access to as a nation if only we are able to use them effectively. And I think that that's a, a really important important element. And then I think just the third element is that, you know, there is a, a real importance of space uh, as an asset for mankind and that we, you know, we have the ability to use this effectively and responsibly and ethically, making sure that we're using the right kinds of technologies, making sure that we're using those technologies in the right way. And in doing so, we really are helping to solve some critical issues for South Africa and, you know, as you put it, for, for the whole world. Francois, thanks. Thanks very much for joining us. Any closing remarks that you'd like to share with our listeners? So, Davis, thank you very much for the invitation to be on the show with you to this podcast. I perhaps want to take this opportunity just to say to the listeners to mention that South Africa needs people studying the, the STEM disciplines, the science, technology, engineering and maths. We've got a shortage. And I hope that what we're doing at CPUT will inspire young people that, uh, that are not quite sure what they want to go and study. But what we're, what we're doing at the moment with satellites is just the beginning. The sky is literally the, the, the limit. I hope that this inspires you. There's so much uh, more that we can do with space technology. So, Davis, I'm glad that our paths cross and that we um, find time to speak about mutual interests here. And I want to wish the Innovation Hub good luck and good success in the future. And I hope that we can continue um, talking about maritime related problems together and, and solve them together. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm absolutely sure that we will. You know, space technology, as you say, the sky is the limit. And we are really only just starting now. So, I think there will be many opportunities for us to, to have further conversations. Thank you once again for sharing your time with us today. Uh, and to our listeners, thanks for, for tuning in. Please remember to like, share, follow, uh, and engage and comment on this podcast. How do you see the interaction between maritime and space technology? Where do you see this going in future? So get hold of us either through your favorite social media channel or via email at innovationcampus at S-B-I-D-Z. That's uh, Sierra Bravo India Delta Zulu dot C-O dot Z-A. Thanks very much. And join us again for our next podcast coming up. Uh, so until then, good luck, stay safe and keep innovating. If you have any thoughts or questions, on this episode or any ideas for future podcasts please send us an email at innovationcampus at sbrdz.co.za until next time let's innovate the blue